here this morning, and we're so thankful that we are. And I just want to say this to you. Um, I don't know how long we'll be able to meet in person like this. My hopes is that things will continue to move forward, and uh, we won't have any restrictions put in place uh, that limit us. We're working hard. Um, everything's been clean thoroughly this week. Um, we really took precaution. We put out the communion cups with gloved hands, and we're all wearing masks and doing the things that the experts tell us to do. Um, but I'm sure you're aware, and those of you who are home right now, um, this might be a factor in why you're not here with us, um, that things are not trending in the right direction right now in terms of the transmission rate of COVID-19. And I know for all of us, let's just be honest, that's disappointing. It really is. I know I see a lot of young people out here, students. Um, I've got three teenagers in my home right now, and it is very hard on them. Uh, some of you are coming in here right now, and you're on empty. And In fact, part of the reason you're here this morning is you're like, I'm desperate. I just need something, and I get it. And so whether you're watching from home or you're here in person with us right now, um, we know that this has been a very trying year. I wish we could just skip 2020, um, but that's not the way it went. And I have a feeling when we look back down the road in our lives and we look back at 2020, we're going to realize that God did a lot of really cool things in our lives in spite of the challenges. And so I just wanted to recognize um, that um, this moment, let's just soak it in for what it's worth right now. Let's go all in in our worship of God today. Let's hear what he has to say. Let's enjoy the moment that we get to be in this place together to see what God's doing. Just to know that even though we've been separated by distance over the last eight months, we're still together in heart. And one thing that we've learned and been reminded of over and over again over uh, the last year is that the church is not a building. And the church isn't a particular hour on Sunday morning where we come together. No, the church is a movement. When Jesus launched the church, he launched a movement. And the Bible tells us that those earlier followers of Jesus, that they turned the world upside down. And they did it under great obstacle, great persecution, great challenges. And you know, we've got some of that in the mix right now. And I believe God's doing a new thing. I believe he is working even in spite of the challenges and great things are going to come out of this season. So let's just enjoy the moment. Um, what we've said, just so you know the metric that we're using, if uh, the government comes out, if the, the governor um, says that we can't have more than 25 people uh, in inside at one time, even with the precautions we're taking of the social distancing and the masks, um, if we can't do that, then we'll have to go back to just online services. We will be live streaming it like we are right now, so you'll get to tune in. It won't be pre-recorded. Um, now that we've got the technology and we've, we've, we've done the hard work of getting that up and running, um, we're there, and so that's exciting. Uh, maybe we'll have a few people in the room, but we won't have, be able to have our full-on services with kids and everything like we're doing right now. So you can just kind of keep an ear out um, if you watch and you hear that that uh, has been decided upon and, and they've limited uh, how many people can be indoors beneath 25, then you'll know um, we're going we're gonna to comply with that. And, and the reason that we're doing that is not only do we want to serve our faith community well here, but we really want to serve our community around us as well. And I see all of you right now are wearing your mask. And, and depending on where you stand on that issue, I realize there's a lot of different opinions. But here's, here's our, our approach. Um, I want to serve people. Jesus said that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to be a servant to all. And, and we want to do the same thing. And so I really appreciate your heart, even in coming in today, doing the social distancing, wearing the mask, all of those things, uh, because it's a way you can serve others. Some amongst us are probably more vulnerable than others, but we really do appreciate uh, your willingness uh, to do that. And so that's why if the governor says, hey, you can't meet with that size of group, um, then we're going to continue to make sure we're serving our community uh, both internally and externally at the same time. So just know um, we're watching that closely. Uh, we want to do our best to keep everybody safe and uh, do the right thing. No easy decisions. Uh, there might be other churches who continue to meet, and uh, we'd never be critical of what someone else is doing. This is just the path that we've chose uh, to take as, as our leadership. 
All right, that's all I wanted to say. Now let's get into the message. So uh, go ahead, take out your Bibles. Uh, turn to the book of Matthew. Last week we kicked off a new series. I hope you got to tune in for that. Um, if you did it, then it's available on demand. If you go on to our Bridge Church website, bridgechurchnj.org, you can uh, find that message there and catch up. I'd really encourage you to do that because we're really building uh, an understanding of how we can live our lives without drinking the poison. And when we talk about that poison, the idea that we want to convey is, is when people do things in life that hurt us, and let's be honest, it happens. I would guess probably everybody in this room experienced some type of hurt, some type of offense, even this week. In fact, could, could, could I just, could I ask you to be bold enough, if, if somebody did something that hurt your feelings, offended you, wronged you this week, would you just lift your hand up right now? How many of you? You say, I can think to a moment. <laughs> yeah, a lot of hands. If you did it, no problem. Um, yeah, I mean, let's be honest. It's just part of of life. When we live in community with other people, we're going to get offended at time. And what we learned last week, and this is so important because this is a starting point for what we're going to talk about this week. What we learned is that it's okay to feel offended. So somebody does something that hurts us. Maybe they don't show up when they should have. Maybe, you know, they don't respond the way that we wanted them to. Somehow they hurt us. We're offended by what they did. It's okay to feel that. I mean, that's unavoidable. It's inevitable. But what's not okay, according to Scripture, according to what God says, is it's not okay to live offended. So what happens is, and we use the analogy of a glass, that when somebody hurts us, when they offend us, it's like they've served us up a glass of poison. And, and so the the question that, that we have to answer when that happens to us is, when we are served that glass of poison, are we going to drink it? The offense is the poison, but we haven't taken it in until we choose to live offended. And the Bible tells us that we can live a life free of offense. There is a pathway for that, and we're going to talk about that today. We're seeing offense in two stages. Stage one is to feel offended. Stage two is to live offended. So today I want to start from that point and build off of this. And we're going to start by reading a passage in the Gospel of Matthew. So if you have your Bibles or your phones, uh, go to your Bible app, Matthew chapter 11. We're also going to have it up on the screen for you as well. Matthew chapter 11, and we're going to start with verse 2 there. It says, Now when Jesus heard... In prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word, I'm sorry, did I say now when Jesus, when John heard in prison about the deeds of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Jesus answered them and said, go and tell John what you hear, what you see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the leopards are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them, and watch this, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So let me just kind of give you a little bit of explanation of the verses that we just read. Maybe you caught some of it, but probably not all of it. John is the cousin of Jesus. And John had a special calling in his life. He was the one who was going to go before Jesus and proclaim Jesus' coming. But there was a moment in time where it wasn't clear to John whether or not, in fact, Jesus was the promised one that the Jews were waiting for, the Messiah. And so John has this question as he's sitting in a, in a jail cell. He hears the stories about Jesus, that he's healing people, that, that people are, who, who have been deaf since they were born are suddenly hearing, and people who weren't able to see can suddenly see. I mean, imagine this. This is, this is really incredible. He hears these stories, and, and, and it makes him wonder, okay, he knows Jesus, he's his cousin, but is Jesus God? Is he the Messiah, the promised one? And so he just comes right out and asks this question. Is he God in the flesh? Now, this is a great question, and I want you to know, if you're here today, this is the most important question that you could ask and, and understand and learn in life. Who is Jesus? 
Maybe you've heard it said before. Either Jesus was a, a liar, a lunatic, or he's the son of God. Because Jesus made all these proclamations about himself. And if those things aren't true, then it makes him, honestly, to be an awful person. But if the things are true, and they are, if the things are true that he says, if the things are true um, that we have in God's word, then we have no doubt to believe that he is, in fact, God incarnate, God in the flesh. And so Jesus has come he proclaims this to John, and then he says these words. He, he, he makes this very powerful statement that really ties into this topic of not drinking the poison. He says this, blessed or happy. If you ever see the word in the Bible, blessed, you can replace that word with the word happy. Happy, blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Now this is interesting, because I don't know what's going on in John's mind, in John's heart, and why Jesus needed to say this to them. Part of Jesus being Jesus, being God, was that he is all-knowing. And so he knew what was behind John's question of whether or not Jesus was in fact the promised one, whether or not he was God. He knew what was in John's heart. And it is possible, just hear me out, it is possible that as John was sitting in that jail cell, that he was actually mad at Jesus. He may have even been offended by Jesus. Now, I know that sounds crazy because you're like, how could you be offended at Jesus? He's perfect. Some people are. Some people are mad at God. Maybe sometime in your life along the way, if you're really honest, you've been mad at God. It's okay. You can be mad at God. Tell him. He's big enough to handle it. And, and so here, John is in jail, and he's wondering, perhaps, he's even offended, why hasn't Jesus showed up for me? Think about this. I mean, Jesus got, has the power to heal the lame, to heal the blind, to raise dead people, bring them back to life. Can't he break John out of jail? Can't he use that power to move in John's situation? Perhaps, we don't know, but perhaps John was discouraged. Perhaps John was even offended because of what was happening to him. We don't know that. But it's possible because Jesus makes this statement. Blessed, happy is he who is not offended because of me. You see, if John was feeling this way, I can tell you this, he's not alone. He is not alone. Because the number one reason people live offended is unfulfilled expectations. Some people are even offended by God because they feel he hasn't showed up for them. They didn't, he didn't do what they wanted him to do. And so they go around, they're full of, of hurt, they're full of pain, and they're drinking the poison because of these unfulfilled expectations. I think there's a principle here that Jesus wants us to understand. We can't afford to live offended. Hear me. You can't afford to live offended. It costs too much. The price is too high. It feels good in the moment to just get stuck in that place. We feel like we're getting even, like we're getting back to be offended by that person who hurt us. But it cost us such an incredible price. It has an emotional cost to it. It has a physical cost to it. And ultimately, it has a spiritual cost to it. It's like we are taking a glass full of poison and drinking it when we choose to live offended. So many of us live offended because we have unfulfilled expectations. Let me, let me illustrate this for you in a, a few different contexts. In, in the marriage relationship, there's a lot of people that I've talked to over the years, and, and this is what I've heard. They weren't the person I thought they were going to be. When I signed up for marriage, this isn't what I had in mind. And they're full of hurt. They're full of, of, of offense. They're, they're drinking that poison. Or maybe it's in the friendship context. 
That person, I trusted them. I told them everything. I bore my soul to them. And they betrayed me. That was not what I expected. And we're hurt. We're drinking from that poison. We're living in that place. Or how about with our children? With our children, you gave up so much for them. And all you want in return, all you want is for them to pick up the phone and call. Like, I mean, is that that much to ask? To just have a relationship? For them to make a little bit of effort? It's just reasonable expectations. And here we are. We're stuck in that hurt. We're drinking the poison. Maybe it's with your parents. They were too hard on you. Or they were too soft on you. And you just keep thinking about that. You keep thinking about that disappointment. You see the relationship that other kids have with their parents. Kids, teenagers, hear me. And you see that and you're like, why can't my mom be like that? Why can't my dad be like that? Why does it have to be like this in my home? And we have these unfulfilled expectations. And it takes us down this road of living offended. And we just can't let go. We just can't move on. And really, these, these unfulfilled expectations really present themselves in three glasses. So I want to continue with this analogy of drinking poison. And I want you to just picture three glasses. And, and the first glass is this. The first glass is unspoken expectations. These are the expectations that we have for the people in our lives that seem so obvious, that seem so clear, that we don't even have to communicate them. It just seems so plain and simple. They should just know these things. Well, of course I have these expectations on my spouse. Of course I have these expectations with my kids. Of course I have these expectations with my coworkers, with my friends, whatever it is. Of course I have these expectations. And we don't even take the time to communicate them but what happens is those needs don't get met and we become full of bitterness. We drink the poison. We've bottled it up, we bottle it up, and finally we guzzle it up because of these unspoken expectations. Now, this can go both ways. First of all, we've never communicated to the other person what it was that, that was missing. So we've never given them a chance to either explain themselves, maybe perhaps there's a misunderstanding, or to make a course adjustment. Sometimes we hurt people, right? And we don't even realize that we're hurting them. But because it's never been explained, because it's never been communicated, I see this all the time in my own home. These are unspoken expectations and the hurt builds. The offenses build up. Not only do we feel that way internally, but also because we haven't communicated it with the other person, we haven't really identified the hurt. It's just kind of this feeling that we have down in our pit, the pit of our stomach, that we continue to, to uh, mull over, to feel, to, to uh, uh, just immerse in. But we don't get deliverance from that. And part of the reason is we've never articulated it. We've never called it out. We've never really thought it through enough to identify. And so we find ourselves stuck. And the more stuck we are in offense, the more likely we are to drink from the poison. Unspoken expectations. Now the Bible talks about this. Jesus gives us some really clear advice on how to handle relationships that are broken. There are times in our lives where people are going to wrong us. Not a person has been not a person has ever lived who hasn't been hurt, hasn't been offended by somebody. Like I said, it's probably even happened to you in the last week, maybe in the last day, maybe even in the last hour. I don't know what your ride was like coming into church today or you that are at home, what your morning routine looked like. Hurt's gonna come. Offenses are going to happen. The Bible tells us that people will sin against you. And so Jesus gives some direct counsel, some direct advice on how to handle it when that happens. When somebody wrongs you, what are you supposed to do? What does the world say? What does everybody say around us? Get even, right? They, 
they trash you on Twitter, you trash them on Twitter. You know, they're mean to you, you be mean back and, and go even further with it. It's just natural. It's our natural response. But the Bible has a different approach. It says this in Matthew chapter 18. It says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. That's a little different than what we see, right? Normally our reaction when somebody does something that hurts us is we call a friend, right? We tell somebody else, somebody else who's going to take our side because we feel hurt. We want to be vindicated. We want to be justified in that hurt. And so we actually seek that out. Instead of going to the person, we leave those hurts unspoken. We leave those expectations unspoken. We don't deal with them directly. It says, if he listens to you, you will have gained your brother. In other words, the relationship saved. Like, if, if they hurt you, and, and you let them know what happened, if you let them know how you've been wronged, if you communicate, listen, it could go two ways. There's an if there. Because their response might be, too bad, so sad. That might be the response. And many of you have experienced that in your life. Where somebody has hurt you, you've communicated it, and that's how they've reacted. There's not much you can do with that except bring it to God. But there are a lot of times, I have witnessed it firsthand over and over again in relationships that when communication is done in a healthy way, following the advice that the scriptures give us here, when we go privately, we don't talk to our families about it, we don't talk to our friends about it, we just go to this person and we say, let me know, let me tell you how I'm feeling and why I'm feeling this way. It gives them an opportunity to make it right. And it's such a beautiful thing when that happens. So don't live in that unfulfilled expectation world. Let the person, right now, you think about a person who's, who's just done something that's hurt you that's wronged you, that you've never communicated that to. Follow Jesus' advice here. Go to that person. Tell them what's going on inside of you and give them a chance to work through that with you. There's a risk, yes, but the payoff is so incredible if that relationship can be restored. The second glass. So the second glass that often leads us to this, this place of, of bitterness to this poison is, is the glass of unmet expectations. Unmet expectations. This is the glass we drink from when over and over again someone fails to meet our expectations. And it finally brings us to the place because there's this long history of this. They continue to fail to meet our expectations and we finally feel like we are past the place of no return. The point of no return. We, we just can't forgive any more. At least that's what we think. Now let me, let me make this, this point here. That forgiveness and trust are not the same thing. I mentioned this last week. Forgiveness is something that because Jesus forgave us, we are commanded to forgive other people regardless of the transgression. But trust, trust is something that is earned. And that's okay. So we can forgive someone without trusting someone. When someone has a track record of continually letting you down, you are wise to not trust them. But what you're not okay to do is to not forgive them. To continue to, to harbor those ill feelings, to continue to let that fester inside of you. When you do that, you drink the poison of unmet expectations. Ephesians 4.32 talks about how we're to forgive each other. It says, forgive one another even as Christ forgave you. Now think about this. Jesus gives us a lot of expectations, doesn't he? <laughs> Just pick up the Bible. I mean, it's full of a very clear direction on how we're supposed to live our lives. We have expectations, right? How many times do we fail Jesus and how we live. Come on. All the time. Every day. But he never stops loving us. He never stops 
forgiving us. So no matter how many times that person has let you down, how many times they failed you, how many times they've, they've failed to, to meet your expectation, it doesn't mean that you can't continually love and forgive them. Now it's going to take time and effort on their part to build back trust. And that's a whole different process. But forgiveness, forgiveness is a choice that you can make. And when you choose to forgive someone for the wrong that they've done to you, it releases that poison. It has no power to hold you anymore. So choose to forgive. The third glass, the third glass is the glass of unrealistic expectations. So we've got unspoken expectations, We've got unmet expectations, and then we have unrealistic expectations. Now, just go ahead, hold on to your chair right now, because I'm about to shake things up a little bit, all right? I'm warning you, but I believe you need to hear this. You, you need to, you at home, you need to hear this today. You've been living offended You've been living offended because you have these unrealistic expectations that you have put on to someone else. Maybe it's your partner, your spouse. You think about, man, my spouse, they're just not romantic enough. Or they're not spontaneous enough. Or they're not consistent enough. They're not reliable enough. And you have all these expectations that, guess what, nobody can meet. I mean, we watch these, you know, movies and TV shows and Netflix series. And we see these characters. That's not real life. Am I right, ladies? You don't just wake up in the morning and your hair's done and your makeup's perfect and all that. It takes work. It does, but we watch this play out on the screen and we're filled with these images of what life is supposed to be like. We go on to social media, oh come on now, right? We see that Instagram feed of that other family, that other person, and, and we see the perfect life that they live. And we're wondering, why isn't my marriage like that? I wish my wife would post that about me. I wish my family pictures looked like that. I wish our vacation had that. We have all these unrealistic, unrealistic expectations. And we put that on other people. We put that often on the people that are close to us. We put that on our spouse. Here's the thing. The spouse that's crazy spontaneous, guess what? They're probably not going to be super consistent. That's not the same person. So what we do is we learn to, to appreciate the good in people and we learn to look past the shortcomings. And ultimately, it brings us to Jesus. We'll get back to that in a second. How about, how about the, the biblical description of a godly woman in Proverbs 31? How many of you ladies have ever seen Proverbs 31? Any of you like just completely capture that every day? Anybody? <laughs> no. No. It's an ideal. It's something to shoot for. But we're never going to get there, are we? It's not realistic. It's not a realistic expectation. It's a goal to strive towards, not to be demanded. Some of you ladies put that on yourself, and you, you need to stop living offended by yourself. You put these unrealistic expectations on yourself. That nobody, nobody could ever live up to. And when you do that, you drink the poison over and over again. My kid, my kid's just not responsive to me. They just don't even care about me. They don't even pick up the phone. They don't even come over anymore. You're not realizing maybe that they're going through a lot of their own stuff. Maybe the reason that they're, they're not reaching out to you is because they're hurting so badly on the inside that they're just stuck. And rather than be offended, you need to be praying. Rather than being hurt, you need to, to see how you can help them heal. Unrealistic expectations that we put on other people. If your friend really cared about you, wouldn't they be there with you right now going through this? 
And you don't know the pain. You don't know the, the things that they're going through at this moment in time. You have these unrealistic expectations. And we put that on so many people. We even put it on ourselves. And here's what you need to know. If you get nothing else from the message, hear this. Hear me right now. This is what you need to hear. Where do you go with unfulfilled expectations? You go to Jesus. See, we expect people to fill a role that only Jesus can fulfill. Maybe the reason that, that you're so broken right now in your marriage is you're looking to your spouse instead of looking to Jesus. The, the best thing we can do, the best thing we can do within our families, with our children, in our friendships, is just to keep pointing to Jesus. He's the only one who gets it right all the time. He's the only batter to ever hit a thousand. People are going to let you down. People are going to disappoint you. And, and if you choose to hold on to that, you'll drink poison. But you have another option. Instead of drinking in the poison, sucking that down, you can drink in what Jesus offers. Jesus offers you life. He offers you joy. He offers you peace. Stop trying to put something else in the place, in the void that only Jesus can fill. Somebody say amen. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is this exchange that takes place between Jesus and a very broken woman. Uh, you, you can read the whole story. It's in John chapter 4. I'd encourage you, if you've never read the story, really, really, really cool story. John chapter 4, verse 14. And Jesus meets this lady, and as you read through the passage, it gives you a little bit of her background. I mean, it gets pretty personal. She's been in five failed marriages. That's a lot of broken relationships. And now, the Bible tells us, now the guy that she's living with, that she's shacking up with, he's not even her husband. Whole lot of shame on this lady. In this culture, she's an outcast. She's out at the well all by herself in the middle of the day, the hottest part of the day. She's there alone, and she has this life-altering encounter with Jesus. She's been drinking from the wrong sources for her entire life. She was trying to find something. She was trying to fill that hurt, that void in her life. And she kept drinking from this fountain of relationships. And guess what? It just left her thirsty. One broken marriage, one broken relationship after another. And here she is at the well. She's alive on the outside, but on the inside she's dead. Because she's never experienced real life. The well that she's been drinking from is dried up. There's nothing there. Nothing that's going to sustain her. Until she meets Jesus on that fateful day at the well. She thought she was going to get a physical drink of water. But what she realized, what she encountered was something way better than a cold glass of water. She encountered Jesus, and as she met him, as he spoke to her, as he looked into her eyes with love and compassion, she offered her another option. And today, he offers you another option. Instead of drinking from the poison that this world offers, all the hurt, all the pain, all the disappointments of life, we can come to Jesus, and he offers us the living water. A water that when we drink from it, it says in John chapter 4, verse 14, it says, whoever drinks of this water, the water that I will give him, will never be thirsty again. You see, this is, this is where we go with our hurt. This is where we go with our pain. This is where we go with our brokenness. Bring that hurt. Bring that loneliness. Bring that offense. Bring that disappointment. Bring it all to Jesus. And drink from him instead of the hurt. He's the living water. And what he offers is the exact opposite of poison. And it's sitting right here on the table for you. But he won't force it on. You have to decide whether you're going to consume him. And here's the thing. The more you consume of him, the more he consumes of you. And the more he controls your life, 
the more joy you will experience in your life. Trust me. I've seen it over and over again. So right now, here in this room, or as you're watching from your couch, wherever you're at right now, I want to invite you to drink from the living water of Jesus today. If you have never experienced the forgiveness that comes from God that was made possible through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, you see, our sin offended God because He's perfect. He's righteous. But even though there was this gap that stood between us and God and his perfection, he made a way for us to get to the other side. And that way was Jesus. And today he offers us forgiveness. The glass is sitting there. It's for you to decide, am I going to pick this up and drink of this today? If you'd like to do that this morning, wherever you're at right now, I want to give you the the opportunity to do that. Just bow your heads and close your eyes right now. Here in the room, online. And just have a conversation with God right now. These are not magical words. This is about your heart. This is about you coming to God broken and saying, God, I need you. So let me lead you in a prayer today. Say something like this. God, I know that I've done some wrong things in my life and that that sin has separated me from you. And today I recognize that Jesus went to the cross to pay for my sins and to pave a way, to make a way for my relationship with you to be restored. Today, God, I accept the gift of salvation that you offer me. I want to drink from that living water. I want to be changed from the inside out. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer right now, whether you're here or you're online, we would love to know you made that decision. And so you can use our digital connect card. Uh, we got a couple of emails this week from people uh, who had tuned into our message throughout the week that had made faith commitments. I want you to know this. The Bible says when one sinner, that's us, <laughs> comes to repentance, all of heaven breaks out in jubilation. So right now, can we have a little jubilation here for those people? Yeah. Yeah. Who have, who have experienced new life through Jesus. They've drunk the living water. And for those of you who have experienced this salvation already, you've made this decision, you've, you've turned over control of your life to Jesus. You've accepted his grace and forgiveness. Let me ask you this question. Let me leave you with this. Who do you need to forgive today? What hurt or offense have you been holding on to that you just need to let go of? An unspoken expectation, an unfulfilled expectation, an unrealistic expectation. What hurt are you holding on that it's just time to bring it to Jesus and leave it at the altar once and for all? You see, Jesus will help you. He will. Just ask him. Just ask him. So right now, let's do that together. Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes. Let's lift our hearts up to him. Let me just ask you, if you want to pray this with me right now, just in a, in a moment of solidarity, would you just lift your hands up with me to heaven? Let's just surrender all of our relationships to God today. This is just a picture of surrender. God, we bring all of our hurts, all of our pain, all of our disappointments, all of our offenses, all of our unfulfilled expectations. Right now, God, we're surrendering them to you. We're no longer going to hold on to the hurt. We're no longer going gonna, to gonna hold on to the past. Hash it over, over and over again in our lives and keep drinking from the poison. God, today... We're bringing these to you. Take these hurts from us and heal us. Heal us today from the inside out. Right now, God, we surrender ourselves to you. You forgive us 
Help us to forgive others in the same way. Give us the courage. Give us the strength. Give us the desire to do this. We pray all this. And everybody said, amen. Thank you so much. Well, it is great to have you. You guys are officially our guinea pigs um, because this was the first time doing it. We've, we've, uh, I did tune in, and it looks like our live stream was working. Woo, that's awesome. So, yeah, a little bit of uh, appreciation for our team that works so hard behind the scenes to make all of these things happen. Um, we've been working around the clock with the technology, with the facility, all the different things uh, to make this possible. So thank you, all of you who've contributed. Uh, we do want to remind you um, that even though the lights keep going on and off, we have been paying the light bill. And part of the reason we've been able to do that is because you continue to be faithful in your giving. Um, don't worry, we're not, yeah. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. Uh, if you call the Bridge Church your home, if you're a guest with us, feel no responsibility. But if you call the Bridge Church your home, um, I'd encourage you to make sure that you're living a generous lifestyle. Not just having generous moments, you know, uh, 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 spontaneous moments of giving. Those are important. But that you would practice regular, consistent giving. And so you can do that. You can give through our normal means if you're online. You can go to our website. You can uh, do text to give. We've got the instructions there for you on the screen. Or um, you can go back to the offering box in the back of the auditorium. Again, we didn't want to pass buckets and, and uh, have a lot of people touching things. So we have a, a box on both sides of the auditorium as you exit the doors. If you want to put a check or cash or whatever in that offering box, it's secured. We'll get that after the service. You can give that way. Or you can stick your phone in the camera mode up to that scan and you can give digitally. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible uh, for you to just live out this generous lifestyle. You know, it's ultimately, it's about your heart. Um, the Bible says where your money is, there will your heart be also. And so we want to make sure that we're demonstrating our love for God and how we're living out generosity. And, um, you know, there are people who are, are uh, in need in our community that because of your faithfulness, we're able to meet those physical needs and just be a place of, uh, of hope. I'm, I'm excited right now because uh, we just recently launched Celebrate Recovery. Uh, at the Bridge Church. And again, your giving makes it possible to have programming like this. This is a program um, that's a 12-step program that has Christ at the center. And uh, we just want to help people in their brokenness, their hurts, their hang-ups, whatever it is that they're going through, we want to be there for them. And so we have a group that meets on Sunday night um, that's here. And, uh, and because you give, because you're faithful, we're able to offer these types of things. So thank you so much for your generosity. Let's continue to do that. Uh, we'll keep you posted on our progress. Lord willing, we'll be back at the same time, same place next week. Make sure you go on ahead of time. It really helped us that you guys reserved. The majority of you that are here this morning, you reserved your slot. Please, 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 as an act of servanthood, uh, would you continue to do that? Because we want to make sure we have a good plan in place. If we need to add another service, we'll do it. If we need to add another two services, we'll do it. Whatever it takes, right? That's our motto, and so uh, you uh, registering uh, for the event helps us to know how we can plan accordingly. All right, we are so glad that you're here with us this morning. Um, we have a habit, if you're new to the Bridge Church, maybe you don't know this, but we have a habit of ending our service saying, we have been the church here, now let's be the church out there. Thank you, you're dismissed. <laughs>